All right, so we've had some pretty interesting calls this week, haven't we? Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, um, I just wanted to do a little bit of a formal debrief. We can talk a little bit from a CQI standpoint uh, about the patient that you had with the uh, cardiac arrest or you could be RSI. Um, who's on that call? Do you want to, to tell us a little bit about um, how it went down? You guys got there first. Yeah, we were the, yeah. the first crew on. Mm -hmm. So we got a patient who was uh, unconscious, mm -hmm. and uh, we started uh, right in with the airway. I knew there were ABCs real quick. Uh, open airway seemed sort of manageable at first. Uh, you know, a little, I had to do some rest of breathing with him with BVM. And, it's a circulation check, had a carotid pulse, and we sort of didn't go further than that. We had to really look at the airway. Okay. And it made it difficult because the patient was acting normal, was in a meeting, collapsed, so we only had a coworker. But the nice thing is the coworker was able to go and call the family to try to at least get a history of any medications, allergies, past medical history. So at least we had that piece coming, but our main concern was the airway. Yeah, that was the yeah. biggest piece. And then you, you guys got there, mm -hmm. and what happened then? Uh, it seemed like they had a, they had a good focus on the airway. They were managing it. They let us know that he did have a heart rate, so he wasn't in cardiac arrest at that point. Uh, we just kind of started working to the next level of assessment to see what other interventions we might need. I think uh, Tyler started working on getting the monitor attached, and I started getting IV access right away. Yeah, we walked in. We got a, a great report from these guys, and then... Actually, went really well. It wasn't as if we were two separate crews, but we kind of joined forces. And it was all four of us as a team mm -hmm. um, once we got there and it started getting to work. So it was really and you know, we started with an oral pharyngeal airway, and that seemed to be working. Mm -hmm. And then we feeling some resistance, mm -hmm. ventilating. Just kept getting worse. Yeah, it just I mean, <laughs> yeah, try we repositioning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we put one airway in, yeah. tried yeah. the nasal airway, and we still felt. You know, if there was resistance. If the patient wasn't being ventilated as effectively, you know, we were even using, you know, our camp position to two of us managing that. Right. And so it was great that ALS was dispatched simultaneously and got there shortly after we did. You know what would have been good for us to put in helpful is if we had an SPO2. Yes. For the, the PLS level to sort Correct. of see what was going on that way. It's hard to differentiate that. Yeah, yeah. and our, our, our airway bag wasn't equipped with that. But that would have been very helpful to have. How about some of the other assessment things that we should be looking at when we first go in? So, uh, you know, his level of consciousness had sort of begun to really wane uh, right on out, and uh, you know, skin color looked okay, you know, perfusion looked okay to start with, so he had a carotid pulse at that moment. I wasn't worried about the rest of it, just the fact that we had to look at the airway, which was degrading as we were going along. Mm -hmm. And you know what, if we had an extra provider with us, you know, we could have had that person do the blood pressure. Right. But our main concern was managing the airway effectively mm -hmm. and using two providers to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like you had a real good airway mm -hmm. established. They did a good job, but once we got there and we looked at the whole picture, he, was, he ended up looking like he had the yeah. right side. Of I think his initial pulse ox was 80s. pretty low in the 80s, yeah. even with the bag valve, two yeah. person bag valve ventilation. Tachycardic. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. Pretty early on, we identified somebody that needed an advanced airway. Yeah. Um, and with uh, you know, his GCS being where it was, uh, less than eight, and the, uh, the difficulties they were having managing that airway, mm -hmm. Tyler made the call pretty quick that this was a good candidate for our side. Yeah. And so we started kind of going down that road, getting the equipment set, and then uh, sort of working off the checklist cool. that we had with our, our gear set. Well, it seems as though there are quite a few things that went pretty well in the closet. Anything that you guys think you might have done differently next time if you had a similar situation? Or what, do you, what do you think about VLS capnography? I think we had the equipment there yeah. initially. You know, we determined it would have been nice to have another provider mm -hmm. to help with, you know, to further the assessment. Right. You know, we were concentrating on ABCs mm -hmm. and in an airway that, you know, wasn't improving with yeah. what we were doing. So I think the oximetry would have been helpful at first, mm -hmm. but I think the LS technography is probably a really good idea. Yeah. I mean, you know, air exchanges, what you're really looking at doing Absolutely. is oxygen is only one side of it, you need to get carbon dioxide out too. Right. So. And it also could have, it could have helped you also, you know, I don't, I wasn't paying very close attention to that, but you, it could have helped you 
better games, the rate of ventilation also. Yes. Um, right. It's not something that we're spending a lot of time thinking and counting. You mm -hmm. have to have some system in place to make sure that you're not hypo or hyperventilating that person. And when we got there, we before we even integrated the guy, I think we threw it out here. We did, yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. That's what I was going to say. When I was reviewing yeah. the case, it looked like uh, the waveform happened pretty early on. And it looked like it was before intubation, right? I so it was. Yes. Using it, it was. PLS Device, we so. put it in line with the DVM and mm -hmm. the face mask. That worked great. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an effective way of looking at capnography mm -hmm. at, at a PLS level. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then we determined as we were taking care of the patient what the GCS was. So right away they had asked us initially. Right. The other thing is we were, we've worked with Tyler and Seth before, so it was nice that we were familiar with how they operated as a crew some of the equipment, mm -hmm. and it made the call go much smoother. We were in a boardroom, so there was more room than the ambulance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that we needed quite a bit of room to manage that patient. Yeah, it was nice. We walked in and started realizing that this patient would be our size, so you need your GCS under 8, mm -hmm. equal to or less. Uh, you need your, your weight over uh, 30 kilograms, and then, you know, more considerations that we, we thought about, maybe we didn't talk about then, but um, it's much easier to uh, perform that in a large space like we had yeah. with more than two providers. We ended up having four. It was terrific. You know, we were up several stories in the office building. Um, we didn't want to have that patient decompensate further as we tried to keep a BLS airway on the way to the ambulance. You know, we had a little bit of a distance to the hospital, not too bad. Um, sometimes, you know, if Seth and I, before we were close to the hospital, we'd keep the BLS and let them handle it because it's just the two of us in the ambulance. You know, good. But uh, I think it worked really well in the big space with the amount of people we had. Yeah. It's an ide the ideal circumstance for that mm -hmm. intervention. I think that's a good point that you mentioned because you get, there are certain firm criteria within the protocol, but there's a lot of other medical decision making that really goes into deciding whether or not you're going to intubate a particular person with RSI. Just because we have the skill, it doesn't mean that we always should be using it. Right. Michael, you're the CQI director. Um, is, is there anything from your standpoint that you kind of look for when we're going through RSI? What, what, what are the things that you're looking out for? Well, I noticed in the paperwork that they had used the check sheet, so I thought that was a real effective method of making sure that every step was accomplished so that the, the, the appropriate care was delivered. Yeah. So that was, I mean, I think critical in this situation. Yeah, you had mentioned the check sheet too. Um, how do you feel as though that worked for you? Did it seem as though it was? Yeah, it slowed everybody down. Yeah. We did it in a fairly deliberate process and with the space that we had, we were literally able to find the items we needed and lay them out because we had some space. Um, not only I knew where they were as the person that was going to do the intubation, but everybody that was going to be helping me knew where everything was. Yeah. Right. So it, it made the whole process, although maybe took a little longer, it made it much smoother, which in the long run made it faster. Yeah. And if something had gone wrong, everyone, we had verbalized the whole thing to each other, everyone knew where the secondary rescue devices were and all that. Correct. I think we were prepared. First backup and second backup were right there and everybody knew where they were. And yeah. for us, it was easy to know what they were going to do, when they were going to do it, what was coming next. But that's a good point. Um, there's been a fair deal of, lit of literature out there li lately in regard to the use of checklists for critical procedures. I mean, it's not something that's new. I mean, every one of us who has gone on, their, on a plane trip um, has hopefully had a pilot that has gone through a checklist. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't want to be flying. Um, so for critical procedures like that, I mean, if you had missed one of those steps on the check sheet, it can really delay patient care. Um, and a lot of people feel as though if you have a critical patient, you really just want to get to it and forget about the check sheet. But the thing is, is that that's probably the instance in which you need the check sheet the most. Because you really don't want to waste time missing a step in the heat of the moment. Um, even if you've gone through it over and over and over, I, again, have a lot of experience, a check sheet is really something that can be helpful in these kind of instances. So I think that was awesome that you guys used it. And I'm glad to hear the feedback. I think it's also important with the medications and the dosages of those as well to ensure that, that we're delivering the proper medication the proper amount. Yeah, that yeah. was great. Yeah. Well, I think what was helpful for all of us was knowing that all the equipment was there if needed. Yeah. And it, you're right, it allowed us to um, look verbally look at, you know, is that a piece of equipment there? Seth would confirm it. And then Dave and I were looking 
Yes. So we also knew what the next step was since we were managing an airway initially and then turning it over for an advanced airway. And even though we were going through the checklist, we were still moving. Yes. I think one of the first steps on it is pre oxygenate with your angel cannula, which read it out, and they got it out, and then the patient got uh, high flow oxygen through the cannula. So it, was, it wasn't like we were just sitting there doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really helped move us along in a, in a very deliberate pace. And that's another new procedure that Right. We could easily have forgotten had you not yeah. used the check sheet. Sure. That's yeah, true. that's a relatively new thing, but it's so important. Um, we found that even a single desaturation during an intubation attempt can significantly decrease or um, uh, increase the mortality. So, so if you drop your sacs even one time, the chances yeah. of that patient dying go oh, way yeah. up. So, so making sure that we do everything we can to prevent desaturation, we want to prevent hypotension as well, um, and make sure that we maximize our first pass success rate. So, so uh, kind of that basic airway assessment was done as we were approaching him. Uh, we did uh, use the, the Gumbuji stick as to help find the, the trachea, uh, so I was able to visualize clearly, insert the Gumbuji, and uh, both feel and hear the um, the vibrations on the cartilaginous rings of the trachea, and then we were able to slide the 7.5 ET2 right over the gum I think I actually I did visualize one more time as I found some a little bit of uh, resistance, and it was just a little bit of a manipulation to the left of the ET2 to get it through the, the cartilage, but it was a, a very smooth intubation. Uh, and we also used uh, the laryngeal manipulation. Laryngeal right? man manipulation um, right away, actually. Um, I was able to find it and then ask Tyler for some help, and he brought his hand over, and I kind of moved his hand to where uh, I could had the best view and asked him to hold it, and it just stayed there. So uh, it, you know, every time I was able to, to look in, I had a perfect visualization of the body opening. So, so uh, those are a few good points that you mentioned that I just want to uh, touch on. The use of the bougie, I mean, why would we even do it? I know that you had mentioned that you have a few colleagues that probably wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts about, about that? I mean, it's it's kind of an extra thing. It, it kind of is, but it, it actually sort of takes the place of a stylet, if you think about it that way. Mm -hmm. um, it It's, you know, if I had the stylet in, I'd have to remove the stylet mm -hmm. to be able to properly intubate, you know, after I got passive. So it's not really an extra step, it's just a different step. The difference is if you have a properly placed gumbuji and you can feel it in the trachea, mm -hmm. it's just a, one more way that you're confirming that you're actually gonna have good placement uh, once you insert the tube. As a matter of fact, I have a gumbuji here and an endotracheal tube. And for you guys, um, so you are obviously going to be going to paramedic school soon. So we were talking about that after this call. Um, the Gambuji is this. So when we take it out, uh, as you can see, it's semi-rigid. It's got a little anterior bend at the end. Um, it usually comes kind of straight, so we want to kind of make it curved a little bit after we take it out. And we use it under direct laryngoscopy. So when we're looking at the at the cords, we're going to go ahead and insert it, okay? But as you mentioned, you can feel there are tracheal rings. Now, I've heard a lot of people that say that it can be difficult to feel the tracheal rings, and a lot of times that's because they're not exactly doing it right. Um, they're very ginger, but what you really need to do is to generate vibrations. And to generate the vibrations, you kind of have to be a little vigorous, because when you're doing that, can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can also feel that through there, and that's really what you're what you are are going for. And when you feel that, you know that you're in the tube. If, now the thing is, this has to be anterior, so this is a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. You may not be right on the the trachea ring, so you have to move this back and forth in order to feel it. The other way to confirm it is to go all the way down, and this should stop at the carina if you're in the trachea. If you're in the esophagus, and it continues to go through. Okay, okay, so those are some ways, even if you can't see it going through the, the cords, that you know that it's right in the trachea. And then you can go ahead and put this right over the top after you remove the stylet. Um, and generally for adult males, it's about 23 of the lips or so as a general rule, if you're not putting it under, under direct visualization. So um, that's what I have to say about that. 
seems to work well is this external ringual manipulation, which you have the one provider, which I believe it was you, who put your fingers on the thyroid cartilage, and then as the intubator is looking with their other hand, they are maneuvering that other the, the first person's hand to a point where they can see the vocal folds optimally. And then they say, hold it right there. Yep. Then they can get their bougie, and that can increase your first pass success rate as well to decrease the probability of hypotension and um, desaturation. So, highly recommended. Work well in this case. Yep. Yeah. Easy, too. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going through this list that I have pretty good, and you guys, it's almost as if we reviewed this already. So. I don't think we have. Great. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what you do after the patient is in today, because that's incredibly important. We have to make sure that these patients are adequately managed. Um, we have a protocol for how that, and the important thing is that you don't have to be an RSI provider in order to go by the post intubation protocol. So what kind of things did you do after the fact, um, after the patient was intubated? Well, we knew we have to either go for continued sedation, excuse me, or pain control in this. Uh, and most, I think, examples um, in our career, we've gone for the pain control route with fentanyl. Um, our loading dose of 100 mics uh, seemed to keep them sedate and comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, it's, a, it's like a Q5 PRN uh, maintenance dose. I think we gave it at 10 minutes. Um, I can't remember if we gave it at 15 or not, but it, it worked really uh, well. Really. And the traditional thinking is that we, we, we sedate the patients. Now the thinking has changed a little bit to where intubation is a painful procedure. We need to make sure that we provide adequate pain management. So pain management kind of trumps the sedation part. In the, the protocol, you can also do a, a benzodiazepine if you don't have ketamine, but, but ketamine is also a standing order as well. The nice thing about, about ketamine is it's dissociative, but it also has some pain um, so, suppression properties too, so you kind of get the, the best of both worlds there. Um, last but not least, what, one thing I didn't see on um, um, with the PCR with the OG2. Um, yeah. Did you guys consider doing that? Or? We had it, it was on the checklist. Yeah. checklist. So we knew right. where it was. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it just, honestly, there was really, there was no evidence of gastric distension yeah. that we saw uh, at that point. So it kind of, I think the using it kind of fell to the wayside. It was deprioritized for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it has benefits beyond just. You know, avoiding gastric It should be something we should only use if patients vomiting. You yeah. know, there's a lot of good uses for it. We can aspirate some of the time to make sure. Right. Even with a proper well. place, too, right. it's still possible for aspiration to occur. So. Well, does anybody else have anything else that they can think of that went well or that you can probably do better next time? Or? I think it was helpful that we worked together before, mm -hmm. so having us as the first crew in and then Tyler and Seth come in after, we were familiar. And also having seen some of the equipment before was helpful. But I think then once we got to the hospital, we also discussed the call and said, you know, how did it go? Is there anything that we could have done differently? What went well? So we, you know, we even did like a mini debrief when we were first done with the call, so it was fresh in our minds. So. As far as, as equipment goes, it's, it's very helpful for everything to be, in our size case, hyper-organized. We opened our RSI kit with the correct drugs, the correct amount of syringes and needles in our checklist. We didn't have to go hunting for, for anything. And it was really easy to just draw it up, play people over the checklist, and we're ready to go. And I think, you know, to Tyler's point as a team, it's good to have a few sets of hands there. Mm -hmm. When we were first managing the airway, it was really important to have two sets of hands mm -hmm. really controlling the airway. That made a huge difference. We really couldn't go past that in taking care of this patient, so that was really a, a good facet. It looks like the patient's condition really improved once they, you know, managed the airway appropriately and got the tube in. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's critical that you know, the first attempt was was so successful, and especially when using the bougie. Yeah. Yeah. Now, well, one thing that's very easy to do, and I kind of picked up on this a little bit with the way from a cabinography, is when we're ventilating, and all of us have a tendency to uh, do this, we kind of ventilate a little too fast. And um, the problem with that is that you blow off CO2, you get that down too low, you can run into some issues with that. And we really don't want to be over-ventilating these patients. So what, what are some of the things that you use in order to try to prevent over-ventilation of the patient? 
Well, certainly monitoring cathnography would yeah, help in a case like this. Right. Keep that count going. Don't just assume you're squeezing the bag at the right time. Good. So ideally, you want to keep it between 35 and 45 millimeters in that period. Mm -hmm. What? Six to eight seconds in an adult. Yeah, so it's a lot slower than I think a lot of us tend to bag. And it's something that I consciously have to remind myself of because it doesn't feel natural. Well, I think it's really important that the team members spoke to each other after the call and, and shared the, their experiences and what they thought went really well and what went, you know, could have been done slightly different. Now, Mike, what would be helpful, too, for us, since we had, there was a sudden occurrence with the patient, no history, is it possible to check with the hospital to see what the patient outcome was? Certainly. We can file up a follow-up report and, okay. and see what information we can get. That would be helpful and for us. Part of the CQI practice. So right. Practice. Absolutely. That's good. We'll make sure we get that out to you. Oh, thank you. That's helpful. All right, guys. Well, you have a safe tour. And um, I'll see you out there. Okay. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.